All right. Okay, so the course, I hope that you're sitting in the correct room. This is PG310. The long title is Formulation and Solution of Geosystems Engineering Problems. It took me, I think, a year to remember the entire title. It's really introduction to numerical methods would be a traditional uh, name for it. And we are going to learn also how to implement those numerical methods along the way. Uh, I don't expect you to have a programming experience. We're going to start uh, from zero. My name is Masha Pradanovic, and my email is listed everywhere and anywhere. So just to uh, quickly introduce myself, I respond to a lot of things. Masha, Dr. Masha, Professor Masha, Dr. Pradanovic, Professor Pradanovic, Dr. P, whatever is easy for you. There's one thing you cannot call me, and that one is a difficult one because that's the way it's written often. Masa. Don't do Masa. And there's a reason for it. I originally come from Croatia. In Croatian, Masa means mass. So I don't like being called mass. <laughs> no. Masa tends to have a lot of different things, a lot of different languages. The best one I've heard of is that it means a diamond in Arabic. That's great, but uh, when you say masa, I identify to what my native language is. And that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's um, that's uh, mass. Uh, masa is actually it could be yummy, it could be masa farina, which is the <laughs> tortilla mix, right? But again, I don't identify it. <laughs> so, so try to say should somewhere in there. My last name is a little difficult to handle and remember. I don't mind whatever, however you butcher it. I will probably butcher your name <laughs> on occasion as well. So we can have that kind of relationship, I guess. But Dr. P works if nothing uh, works. I'm not formal. I don't care about titles. So whatever you do, uh, just communicate. How's that? Um, you can find more about me on the official website. And I best respond to email which is masha at utexas.edu. Officially, there is no H in my name. I stick it in so you can actually say it correctly, Masha. Yeah. Now, my background is I got my bachelor's in Croatia uh, in applied mathematics. I did my PhD in New York State, State University of New York uh, in computational applied math mathematics. It's during that time that I started working on flow and force media. And one thing led to another, I transitioned to petroleum engineering through a series of research titles. I first showed up in Austin in 2005 as a postdoctoral fellow. So that's after your PhD, you get additional training, especially if you want to be in academia. Uh, and then I was a research associate and then assistant and associate professor here at UT. So uh, basically, uh, most of my applications right now are in petroleum engineering. My uh, research interests are basically flow and transport in porous materials, specifically on a small scale. And one such scale is shown here. So this is a sandstone. This is from an image, X-ray image of a sandstone, reconstruction of a 3D space. And basically you can solve flow simulation, do flow simulation on such small scale, which typically gives you something like this. This is a residual oil saturation visualized inside of the rock. So if you're trying to design methods for enhanced oil recovery, where you're trying to get blocks like this out, this is something that is helpful. So that's really in a short terms. This, when it's based on images, it's called digital rock petrophysics. Okay? But I'm interested in all kinds of numerical methods and solutions for uh, the flow problems in porous media. Okay? Our teaching assistant is Ning Yu. He's sitting right up there. So why don't you introduce yourself briefly? Thank you. I'm Yu Wang. I'm from China, and currently I'm a PhD student here, and my advisor is Dr. Pradanovic. Thank you. I can pronounce that correctly. <laughs> His so land. I'm researching in enhanced water recovery, basically some core scale simulation of small works. I've been programming for how many years? Since 2010, so I've been a year. Um, outside, because uh, in Finland, I'm doing in Uh, 
um, the auto outside program, I have a, I had a degree in aerospace, so in case you are not in program, I do have some language to pass. So thank you. So I think between Ningyu and I, you can see that actually switching fields is quite common. So your learning right now is just a start. If somebody told me back when I was an undergrad, hey, you're going to be a professor in petroleum engineering one day, I'd be like, say what? <laughs> At that time, it was like, what is petroleum engineering? But one thing leads to another, and a lot of things make sense, and you can apply knowledge that you have to a lot of different things. So don't limit yourself and uh, your possibilities. Uh, reality is that technology changes a lot. So you have to actually sign up for a life of learning. And the, the, the undergraduate degree gives you a foundation. Most of your foundation is actually engineering, science and engineering. And you are then specializing it somewhat to petroleum engineering. But that doesn't mean that you cannot switch later on. One of these most common denominators is actually computational science. Yeah. Learning how to implement to solve problems numerically. Most of the problems we cannot really solve on pen and paper, or we can in a, an extremely simplistic way. Okay. So being able to apply numerical methods, which is part of what this course is, makes you a computational engineer, which is much broader than just being a so if later on you need to do that kind of specialization in your uh, life, and I don't know what will come your way, you don't know either, okay? you just have to be ready to pick it up and go. So that, that's something that makes you much a broader engineer and not just a pro engineer. So whatever we learn in this course will be quite broadly applicable. We will have examples that come from petroleum engineering but really, all that we learn in this class is a, can be applied anywhere in science and engineering classes. Okay? And it's really just to get you started. So let's just walk through syllabus. I'm going to open up a copy. So just to set things how... So we have already introduced ourselves. First things first, office hours if you need help. Uh, right now, I scheduled my office hours on Monday, Wednesday at 4 to 5 p.m. Okay. In CPE, uh, this is my office on fourth floor here in this building. Okay. And then, oh, is this the correct course? This is not the correct course. Well, like, wait a second. I was like, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> All right, this is the one. I do teach two classes. So if I, on occasion, post a homework that really doesn't make sense, must be that I posted the wrong file from the wrong class. <laughs> so just be kind, send me an email. Hey, Dr. Pradanovich, this is not what we're supposed to solve. Is anybody else in transport phenomena? This, no, so it's probably coming up later. I teach transport on the graduate level. Okay. So my office hours for this class are Wednesday 3 to 4 and Friday noon till 1. Does that generally square well? Can you make at least one of those on your schedule? Okay. Otherwise, you can email me and we can try to find something outside of that. And same thing for me and you. So these are the scheduled ones. So mine are in my office. Me and you will be in CP3172. So that's that glass sort of uh, room next to the student lounge. So that's, and it, it, sometimes it gets bigger than that, and then we'll move outside of <laughs> that. So that's next to student lounge, Tuesday, Thursday, 2 to 3.30. Can you make at least one of those? Because if you're going to move things, we've got to kind of act quickly. Because this is going to, again, if you need some hours or time outside of that, that is perfectly fine. Just email us and figure that out. I'm going to get to our course objectives and topics in a uh, moment. I presume that all of you have the prerequisites or elsewhere you wouldn't be sitting here. Um, and all lecture notes and materials such as code, everything that I actually, all of the PowerPoint materials, if I write something I'm going to post everything. So I focus on posting all of the materials online. So you're going to have recordings and you're going to have the written traits. That's not necessarily, doesn't say that you shouldn't be writing notes. Okay. 
but it's just to relieve some stress. This is a large classroom. Sometimes you don't hear very well. So there are certain things that you will miss. I don't want you to be stressed out about missing anything. You won't. That's it. You should be taking notes. There is research saying that despite of the devices and typing on computers these days, which is relatively recent development in human history, our brains and hands have been tied for a long time. And you often work best in terms of developing an idea if you're actually sketch sketching or writing down using your feet. That's the reason number one. Reason number two is that you can actually type really quickly. And when you focus on just retyping what somebody said, you're not thinking. Whereas when you are actually with hand, you're not as quick. And you've got to process the information first and write it shorthand or some sort of processed version of it. And the moment you do that, your retention later is going to be better. So there is actually research and education that proves that. So I think it's to your benefit to actually learn, like write down notes, however imperfect those notes might be. It's actually the point that they're imperfect. Okay? For perfect recording of things, we go to textbooks. That's what they're for. But this, like, basically, hear something, process it quickly, write it down, is going to make you retain the information better. Now, we will code in this class, and you're supposed to have a laptop. Okay? And I would advise that you bring your laptop with you in class. We understand that sometimes that's not going to be possible, and we will bring some departmental laptops here for the, and as long as you have EIT, you will be able to check them out. However, they're really cranky. <laughs> These are old laptops. They're not the smoothest out there. They have the basics of what we need in, uh, installed in there, so they're, they're, they're useful, but you might be the most comfortable if you actually have things in your life. Okay. So that's just, and in that case, I expect you to use the time. I'm not going to necessarily go around and peek into what you're doing and say, please get up, but don't be online. Don't use that time. Use the time between class or class. You don't work in a fire department. If you miss a message or two, it's okay. okay. So you don't have to be constantly plugged into whatever messaging system you use. And actually, it's going to be the best use of your time to be concentrated to work here, even if you get frustrated. Okay. Better to get frustrated here and then learn how to seek help outside of the class than get frustrated when you're alone. Okay. And then there's no one that can help you. So be proactive, learn, use your time better, so then you can actually, when you have fun, you can have fun in peace, not thinking about 310, okay? So just try to, and it's extremely difficult as a society, it's something that we're all dealing with, okay? Faculty will tell you you're not supposed to be on your phones. Trust me, in a lot of faculty meetings, I see faculty on their phones too. So you have to learn to catch yourself. The society of dealing with devices are designed to be a little addictive. That's what they're selling. Okay. So learn that, know that, and guard yourself against it because you're going to be more successful learning here if you're focused on learning. Okay. So lecture over. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Um, so everything will be posted on Canvas. And I will, uh, the lectures that I record, they will be on YouTube because Canvas is not large enough to have that many movies. Uh, likewise, if you actually want to see recorded lectures from previous years, they're actually available for at least three or four semesters. They don't change all that much, okay? And then in terms of hardware and software, I mentioned we will need laptops. We are, have made a major switch starting this fall. And that is this course will be in Python. You have learned of this as probably the MATLAB class. It's MATLAB anyway. That's part of the point. And this is really what we're focusing on is introducing numerical methods. And the choice of software doesn't really matter, except that the fluency in and speed in coding something up is something that you develop in a specific language. It's relatively easy to switch, but not all that easy. It's not super easy, but the concepts are actually the same across languages. Now, the reason for us to switch to Python is that that is the current trend. It's one of the most growing languages. It's actually completely free, which is good and bad. I'm going to explain.
explain that as you go on. And basically, having Python on your CV is the difference between getting an interview or not. Right now, computational science, there's whole, all the buzz about big data. Big data is simply data that is large and that grows at a certain rate. Petroleum engineering is forward. Arguably, we had big data before they had a name for it. Okay? So all of the data you're enjoying that comes in at a high rate, you gotta be able to load that up. If you have 200 gigabytes of data, none of your computers have that much memory. That's big data. Okay. Most of the laptops right now are Mr. Oh, think bad. Would you amuse me? No, 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 just open it up. Let me know how much memory do you have? Uh, that's no, that's not working memory. Your working memory, round. Uh, 8 gigabytes. So 8 to 16 is very common for laptops. Okay? If you have a 200 gigabyte data set, you let me know whether you can read it or not. Okay? For anything, you can have things stored, but if they're open, if a file is open, that means that I have all of the, this file, which is not much for the syllabus, it's probably a couple hundred megabytes. Okay? All of this file is loaded into memory. Working memory of the computer. That working memory is 8 to 16 gigabytes at a time. And a computer is not supposed to have just this file open. It's supposed to have a browser open and whatever else that you decide. Word is open, Excel is open, Python environment is open, whatever else that you have has to kind of fit into this working memory as opposed to just storage. So storage is good for storing, but it's not something you cannot process something without loading it into memory. And we have big data. Now, most recently, or most of the codes out there, and big data is again across industries, not just petroleum, most of the time Python is the language that goes with. So we decided to start making that switch here as well, so that you are essentially, the short of it is you're going to be more employable. Okay? Now, the, as far as the concepts, concepts in terms of numerical methods really remain. So that's something to have in mind. Now, Python is a little, it's not, it's relatively easy to learn. It's not as easy as MATLAB because Mat MATLAB is a company that has made a whole lot of effort making it smooth. Okay? Uh, Python, everybody contributes to it. It's a little bit of a zoo out there because there's really, there's so much material out there in Python that it's mind boggling just to filter through it. <laughs> so, in terms of just deciding what really would be the best for you to use as a material versus not. And we're going to make those selections in this class for you so you can get stuff. But other than that, it's really materials are available. All right. So just exams. So do you, uh, do you all have your uh, schedule for this fall right now with you? Could you please verify that you don't have any other exam? on Wednesday, October 17th, 6th to 8th, class or exam? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Monday is final. So that should be, that should be, the final should be fine. Okay, there's no classes during final this so, and finals should be scheduled so that there's no overlaps. Okay, so that, that part is fine. But exam one and two. So please, can you email me? And so what do you have? Uh, I have an exam during the time for the exam. Okay, so it's called first come, first serve. So go <laughs> either move or do something about it. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is, can you check that beak for me? Okay. And let me know, does anybody have an exam on Thursday that same week? Same time, 18th October. It's first come, first serve. <laughs> so at this point, I claim my flag. <laughs> but chemistry has already, has already claimed the flag. Yes? And you have an exam. Okay, so both of you email me. 
I have a mental note of that. And please check so you have Wednesday. So basically both Wednesdays go for Can you check Thursday for me? For both of these weeks. So 18th of October and 15th of November. It might be that this is a large class and there's like a very people are in different sessions, especially with solids and statics and all that. It has zillions of sessions. So it becomes a problem to avoid all the possible classes. If it is, we're going to deal with it separately. But for now, uh, please email me about Wednesday, and I will send an email as a reminder to let me know if you have any other exam during both Wednesday and Thursday. Okay. So we can find a time that is at least for now unfinished. And then we'll find out the for Right, so the, the, this week is the, yeah, this week is the <laughs> figuring out. Uh, but again, it's a large class and there's a lot of people in different classes, so that's just what it is. Alright, so there will be approximately eight to nine homework assignments, and each needs to be completed within a week. So we will assign first one next Wednesday, and then it's, that's going to be 5th of, uh, 5th of September, and it's going to be due on 12th. Okay? I will also have online assignments, okay? so I will typically email you two days or one day in advance to view a video. And those videos will be anywhere between three, five to 10, typically minutes, sometimes 20. So nothing terrible, just to get you started. So it's again for better learning. If you hear a concept for the first time somewhere else, and then I come to class and reinforce it, you're all better off, okay? So it's not gonna be nothing sizable will ever happen in terms of those videos. It's gonna be again five to 10 uh, videos of you most of the time, okay? so nothing terrible, and you can view it at any point. I might quiz you on your retention of that material just to make sure that you actually watched it, and then we're kind of either just reinforce it a little in part class and then continue uh, from there. Okay? So there will be a team computational project near the end of the class. It will count twice as much as a homework, and typically teams are two or three people working on a problem. Uh, together and you will get two weeks to complete that portion. Okay? So you are expected to be in class. Okay? If you cannot make it to the class and sometimes you have an interview or something else is happening and you have a written proof of what's going on, please just email me okay? and you can go from there. So basically if there is a quiz in class and there will be occasional five-minute quizzes in class, they're unexpected and I don't announce those. But if you're not in class and I knew that you were supposed to go for an interview or had something else uh, that has a good excuse, then you're gonna be, that, that part will be excused, okay? So it's just not gonna enter your grade. But if I don't know about it, okay? I didn't know about it, therefore I count that you just missed the class because you know. If you miss some quizzes, it's not the end of the world. But again, all of this is just to keep you going and focused on the class so that you uh, retain the material. Uh, so, hmm? okay. so quickly, make a note and email me, or email me immediately if you have phone on you. Uh, it's masha at utexas.edu. And this is barely visible, but it's masha at utexas.edu. And check again Wednesday and Thursday. So this is 10, 17, and 18, and 11, I believe 14 and 15, 6 to 8 p.m. So if you have a trouble with one of these times, please let me know. So how will quiz enter the grade? I have 10% reserved for quizzes, okay? And 20% is homework and that computational project, which is worth two homeworks, okay? Proportionally, it goes proportionally into the grade. I will drop the lowest homework score and the lowest quiz score before the final computation of the grade, okay? And then 20% is exam one, 25% exam two, and 25% final exam. So we're gonna have two exams. 
And I do grade on the spectrum, C minus C, C plus, B plus, and so forth. Um, basically, I get this score from all of these components at the end of the class. Okay? You can start computing it early on and see how you're doing. And uh, based on that score, I uh, figure out who's getting which grade. I never know exact what are the exact, exact limits. Uh, that's something that is tuned to the class that I'm dealing with right now. I can share roughly what cutoffs I used in the past. They're never very far from each other. So for instance, for A, typically you need to be 90 and above for the cumulative. Okay, and then course policies. The reason why we are agreeing on the exam time is that once it's set, it's set. There are no excuses for missing it. Okay. Uh, final exam is designed, or the time and place is determined by university. This is a large university, so scheduling all of the exams is not a joke. Okay, it's a big optimization problem because we can't do exam in a classroom like this, which is also the reason why uh, it's problematic to move them. You have to be spaced out. Okay? So this classroom has to be twice bigger than this, and those are in uh, short supply. So that's why it's a scheduling problem, and we have to reserve those rooms ahead of time. Okay? So uh, basically, there's no uh, missing things. Procedurally, it's difficult to change the, uh, the time of the final exam. Unfortunately, here and there, you, it will happen to you that you have two or three finals in the same day, okay? which can be a problem. Uh, if you really have three, uh, then we can try to do something about it. But again, uh, you need to check for all of the exams that you have. You need to check the times now. The times are known, the location is not. Okay? Uh, and alert, uh, if that is the case, so we can try to do something. Um, in terms of homework, it's due one week in class after, uh, after it is assigned. Uh, if you turn it by the end of the day or the same day, or maybe morning, of the, since this is a relatively late class, morning the day after, I take 10% off. Okay. So please focus on finishing it if you can, and sometimes there will be scheduling issues and it will have multiple things to do at the same time, focus on finishing it up. You don't want to fall behind. Uh, the, the schedule kind of moves on and moves rather quickly and you want to try to keep up with it the best you can. If you have trouble or get discouraged, there, are, there is help, so please reach out. You can form groups, students here, to learn together. Okay? Being social is always more fun. There are tutors available for this class, and there is always TA in my class. So between all of those, you can still hide from it if you're not doing well, and you can still not look at it in the eye. Okay? Try not to do that. So if you have a problem, try to face it. Okay, I have a problem with this class, and then you will be faster at resolving that problem. The sooner you say it out loud, the sooner you move on to resolving the problem. It's worth, it's, it's basically, that rule is true for anything in life. Okay? The sooner you acknowledge a problem, the sooner you can deal with it. And postponing it, by and large, makes it more difficult. Okay? And so then it kind of builds up, builds up, builds up, the problem builds up to the point that you might need to drop the class. Okay? So be aware of it, this is my computer. I got email at this point. So, so be aware of that, okay, and be honest with yourself, because there are help resources out there, but without you seeking them, that help is just sitting there without helping you. So make sure that it helps you. Again, okay? there are resources uh, on this campus. Um, so, what else did I say? Don't forget to put your name and EID on all turned work, so we don't play investigators who turned in the homework. And in terms of coping, so a lot of problems that we're going to be working on, they're not new. Okay. This is introduction to numerical methods. All of these problems have been worked on somewhere. 
and most likely exist in some sort of online space. Maybe not in this department because we just switched it from MATLAB to Python, so nobody has it sold in Python. Okay? But, so you will have to work a little harder <laughs> to actually get the solution. But that's it. The point is not that the solution is always actually in whatever you take in your undergrad course, the solutions always exist. But that doesn't mean that you are learning them if they exist and if you copy them. And ultimately, on the exam, you're going to have to be able to write down the code without a computer on a piece of paper. So to get that practice, the best is, even if you get stuck, you first get stuck. Once, then you go and grab a coffee, or whatever is your beverage of choice, come back, okay? and then you get stuck the second time. Okay? And then the third, third time, and then you're like, okay, this, this one's hard, and you probably in that process, you solve the first two questions you had, but then you have three more. Okay? At that point, you see that. And then your learning experience will be better, you will retain the material better, and you will actually learn. And that will ultimately help. So copying is easily done. Also, code is easily copied. Copy. Also, it's extremely easy to see that it was copied. And I did report in the past, and I will again if I encounter Now, what is the penalty for copying? If I catch you and I report you to the dean of students, what happens? Almost. First you get a warning and it's on your record. So when your future employer asks for your uh, transcript, they see that. Second time is my God. And that has happened in this you're actually dismissed for copying one homework. And most likely than not, you've already done that this time. Okay? So just because you're not caught, that doesn't mean it's not offense. And if you actually get that offense on the record, it has serious implications. So ask yourself, is it worth it? We can't catch all the time. It's the same like speeding. There's a lot of people speeding out there. But you pay the ticket, and the police officer holds their lights and catches you in the right position. Okay? They can't possibly, police officers, catch everyone. And the fact that somebody else was speaking at the same time as you is not going to help. So, yes, you might be telling yourself, oh, well, I'm copying, but so is so and so and so and so, and everybody else is copying to some extent. If you're caught, it's serious harm. So think about it. Again, it's better for your learning experience. You're going to just simply enjoy more. No pain, no gain. It's just as simple as that. Okay? So it's not a little painful. You didn't learn it. You didn't live. Okay? So in that sense, don't rob yourself of that experience. Work on it alone. Okay? If you consult somebody's solution or somebody works with you and explains it to you, and often that I will be the one. Okay? You will come to the office hours, and I'll actually tell you how to do this. But what you write down, you have to know how you solve it. And the moment you go and write it down, it's going to be different from mine. Okay? So you acquire that knowledge, and then you produce that homework. That's different from finding my solution and just copying it line by line. <coughs> or worse yet, somebody emails you, and you just submit that directly. So watch out. I do report, and I take it seriously. Alright, lecture over, <laughs> or warning is over, if you have to dispute a graded homework, so if it's homework, Ning Yu grades homeworks, I hear that if he's pretty harsh, he has a right to be, as long as he is treating everybody equal. So I want to hear about it if you think that you were not treated fairly. Okay? So first try to discuss it with him, if he tells you that's how he graded the entire class, that's all fair. It might be harsh, but it's fair. I personally, I don't really grade all that harshly, so be even out. Yeah, really. uh, that's how it is in life. Um, so, and also you have one week within the return of the homework to actually dispute the grading. Same for exams. That's for practical reasons. 
I don't remember how I grade it. I'm trying to be fair. Okay? If I go and I fix the way I graded three weeks from after I actually graded, chances are, even if I have notes, I don't precisely remember how I did something. Okay? And I do try to be fair in terms of grading um, everybody in the call. So again, uh, try to resolve issues within a week. Okay? Attendance is mandatory. I'm not going to check it all the time. Often, instead of a quiz, I'll actually ask you to finish up whatever we were coding that day and just submit it online by the end of the day. So you're going to submit it on Canvas, and that's going to be actually your quiz, right? So we're going to check it briefly. And not like it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not really, it's really just being there or not being there, that kind of submission. But again, I do want to see that you worked on it uh, and dealt with it because that's going to also keep you up to speed and help you stay um, stay uh, disciplined and present in class. Okay? And uh, you're expected not to use your computer for any other purpose than solving class problems. If you need special arrangements, uh, the, you can take uh, your information to services uh, for students and dis with disabilities, and I need a letter for them from them telling me that you need extra time. If you need, in general, I think recordings actually help in that regard. Uh, regardless of whether you have disability or not, you can basically it's something you can refer to and ease your catching up with the class. So that's part of the reason why I do it. UT also has zero tolerance for harassment. So this is basically uh, Title IX is the name of the federal law uh, that prohibits sex and gender bias discrimination. If you are target of it, okay, please say something and try to seek help. This often happens in some sort of power relationships. So in the university, common one is professor or TA and a student. If I hear about it, or if any of you hears about it, we have to report. So we are so-called mandatory reporters. Now, I beg you that that's not the reason for you not to report. Okay? Don't let any issues like that stay there. Oh, because it's really damaging. You might want to shoo it away by not reporting it. It's not going to go away. Okay? And the damage that it's going to do to you internally is sometimes lifetime damage. So you want to, if it happens to you, find a way to acknowledge it and deal with it. If you don't want to, my door is always open. If you want to come and talk to it. But if not, there are there is a spectrum of services in this campus. You can do it anonymously. Just don't let it slip away because it comes comes back and gets you. So that is just my honest um, assessment of it. Is it easy to deal with? No. It's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. And it happens to a whole lot of people. Typically we hear it about against women. But it's even more or under report, more under reported for them. And part of it is the society that expects us to be strong and whatnot and just deal with things. But there are certain places where we need help to deal. So please find that help. Don't let uh, things go under reported. Again, my door is always open, but there's plenty of other uh, resources on this campus. And this is a large campus. And that's actually a good thing about it, because most likely there is some source of help somewhere. And most likely there's someone out there who went through the same thing. So, so think about that if you uh, come across the issue. All right. And then finally, there is a fourth class day cutoff for dropping this course. I'm going to leave that up to you, whether you drop or not. But my door is always open if you want to discuss issues. And for anything beyond fourth class day, there has to be uh, special evidence uh, given. And finally, feedback. So I think by now I've proved that I'm not very formal. You can come and address or communicate in any way uh, you would like. Email works, uh, knocking on my door works, talking to me after class works. And also, if you simply don't want to sign your name for whatever reason, there's an anonymous form and feedback that I collect. 
So I'll just show you quickly how the form looks like. So this is a form. You basically just put your whatever it is that you have trouble with and you submit. Now how is this useful? It's useful sometimes as a statistics gathering thing. If I get at 8 p.m. before the homework is due, I get 20 of these messages saying, the time that this homework is due tomorrow, and we cannot complete it for tomorrow. 20 of those I'm going to take seriously. Okay. For one of you out of 60, there's, it's always going to be the case, right? So that's not enough statistics for me to move the deadline. But if I get 20, I'll be like, all right, a little harder. I'm going to give you an extra day. Okay. So it can be useful that way. And that way you don't identify yourself. You don't. I don't retaliate because most of the time I don't remember. You know? okay. I get so many emails that good luck to me remembering. Okay. So you don't have to worry about it at all. <laughs> so you can easily you can just go sign yourself and you'll be just fine. But if it's a concern, here's an anonymous form. I will also ask you before review, for example, I'm going to time two, I'm going to say, hey, what do you want me to go over? Okay. And again, if there is an issue that I get five of versus an issue I get one of, that's how I, for, for my review, I go first to the issue that has most, uh, most points to give up. Okay? So I use it in various ways. If you just want to talk about something, and again, you're not comfortable walking in or you, for some reason you can't catch me, and you want to be anonymous, Use this. I will, though, possibly, and that's something to think about, I will then drop it up here in class and discuss it openly with everyone without knowing who actually did it. Okay? That can be useful. When you want to deal with something that's a little touchy for whatever reason, or you don't want to show that you don't know something, okay? I might use this like, oh, I got this email, and it seems that enough of you don't know this concept, I'll go over it again. So I can, it can be for computational issues, or it can be for issues in life in general, okay? So if you're bothered by something and you don't want to identify yourself, this is a pretty good way to communicate and let it out. So that's just, it's for you, up to you to choose how are you going to communicate. All right. Basically, this is it for about rules and regulations. Any questions? Yeah? You can ask them in person, you can do them anonymously, <laughs> so feel free to. And if you want to, if this is quick, you can simply click on this um, and send me feedback about class, that's one way. Or exam, rather. All right. So we have a little time left. Okay. So I'm just going to... Uh, Quickly go over the motivation and why I read uh, doing introduction to numerical methods uh, until the class is over. So basically, can somebody tell me what is the fundamental difference between a scientist and a human? Scientists are scientists. Scientists are not doing mathematics and figure out the science. So scientists go into a little more detail, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> and they can also often isolate a single thing. So in chemistry, for instance, a chemist goes and isolates a single reaction okay, and then go work up from there. And you learn something very fundamental about that reaction. In petroleum engineering, we have a well and our reservoir is typically three kilometers below. Can we isolate a single reaction to work on? Do we even know all of the reactions that go on? Probably not, because it's extremely hard to. So, what is the temperature at three kilometers long? Give or take, it grows 20. Huh? That's for the engineers to figure out. <laughs> That's for the engineers to figure out, right? So, on top of the surface, there is temperature, and then by every kilometer it grows, give or take, 23 degrees Celsius. So at 3 kilometers, it's 69 degrees Celsius more than it is on the surface. 
on the surface in Texas is 42 Celsius degrees right now outside. Okay. Or maybe yesterday it was 42, today it's just 40. Okay. So 40 plus 69, that's about boiling. Last time I checked my chemistry class. Right? So there is not much, sometimes we cannot actually repeat that same temperature and pressure. Pressure again grows by 23 megapascals per kilometer. That's the weight on the rock and fluid on top of you. And if you're underwater, then there's also a column of water. Okay? So there's no possible way to repeat those pressures and temperatures in the lab. And yet here we are. We are drilling at three kilometers and five kilometers and even deeper than that. Okay. So engineers often go and try things out. Scientists go and study things in detail, and they might give us fundamental explanation, but it doesn't typically explain all. We still go and do it and learn from practice. So that's kind of the fundamental philosophical difference between a scientist and engineer. So scientists can basically they seek to understand a core of nature and isolate single things. And engineers, they design and build things and they work with what they have to work with. And often it's, okay, well, we think this is what's going to go on. We're going to go and do it and then learn from mistakes and back, back up and then improve and always iterate on improvement. Part of this iterate and improve, okay, we're going to learn in this class. You will never write a perfect program in the first part. With a lot of experience that I have on you, and I have 20 plus years extra, right? I still don't write the perfect solution for the first part. It appears so in class, but mind you, I've been teaching this class for a while, so I can just look out and just type them, okay? And I will still make small mistakes, you will see them. Typos we always do. So there's always, you have to always be alert for error and iterate and improve iteratively. So engineers, especially in scientists, everyone, as we learn, we improve by iteration. Don't expect to just roll out and find a solution. Never works. Okay? Be ready to improve. Okay? And that's specifically true for computation. Okay? And petroleum engineers actually, so all of these temperatures and pressures that I measured, uh, mentioned, they deal with some of the most extreme situations engineers do overall. Okay? A biomedical engineer by and large, de designs devices that work on room temperature in a doctor's office. Okay? Temperature is kind in an air conditioned building. Okay? If you have to have design a device that measures pressure here versus three kilometers down, two very different volumes. Okay? Drone engineers, many employees, are also paid a little better because of that uncertainty and because of that pressure. Okay? But there is certain you have to be accustomed to a certain level of uh, things not being easy. Okay? And not being able to control everything all the time. So constantly seek to improve. And this class is actually one form of practice for that. So the way we build knowledge typically, we have three basic tools, and they're kind of exemplified here. What are the, our basic tools? Give me just one minute to wrap this up. Einstein is a symbol of theory. Right? Then we have experiments in the lab, and this is actually computation. Okay? So in this class, you're going to learn computation, but these three things work together. They're never really on the same scale and the same problem. They complement each other. Okay? So that's how we build knowledge, and you're going to learn about the computation. I see you on Friday.